What is up everyone? Welcome back to another video with The Bear Report. We're going to talk about a genetic testing company called Invite. We try to get this video out as soon as possible since our thesis was on bankruptcy concerns and rumors came out upon putting this presentation together, but we believe this company is indeed headed for bankruptcy. But before we get into it, do us a favor and subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date on our future content and don't forget to like the video. So there are two things we're going to break down. The first is management. Within this, we are going to cover dilution, their poorly timed acquisitions, and management resignations. The second thing we're going to analyze is the underlying core business. Here we will look at their financial statements, unsustainable cash burn, cost-cutting initiatives, New York Stock Exchange non-compliance, and their increased competition. These two things will get us to our ultimate bear thesis, which signals bankruptcy. And before we jump straight into this, like we always do for our videos, it's best to have a solid grasp on what this company does so we can understand the bear thesis more. So when Vitae was originally spun off from Genomic Health in 2010, the company was created to provide the modern infrastructure for distributing comprehensive genetic diagnostic tests that improve the global standard of healthcare, which is basically as seen in their mission statement here. And Vitae's mission is to bring comprehensive genetic information into mainstream medicine to improve healthcare for billions of people. And Vitae has this vision that they can transform our traditional methods of healthcare, as seen here as symptom-based healthcare, and transition this into a genetics-based uh, healthcare method. Essentially, what it's doing is improving healthcare decisions using the human genome and decades upon decades of data from it. I will show a visual later on how Invite will serve as a database for genetic information, but this is how Invite will supposedly make informed health decisions. This revolutionary genetic-based healthcare method would be able to make clinical decisions across the entire lifespan. So it wouldn't be limited to just one stage of life, like for example, um, infancy or specifically focused on women's health. It would be a one-stop shop for clinical decision-making across the entire lifespan. Right now, Invite is building their genetic-based database by offering four primary products. These are oncology, women's health, uh, rare DX diagnostics, and patient network and data. As depicted in this slide, Invite supposedly is able to enhance their product offerings when focused on these four areas. This will allow them to build that database we have been talking about. So now you may be wondering how this process works. Well, I'm not a scientist or an expert on the human genome, but I know enough information through our research to understand how Invite's testing process flows. As seen here, it first starts out with ordering a test. The demand for genetic testing varies significantly based on individual circumstances. Like for example, a young couple exploring family planning options versus a seven-year-old cancer patient seeking specific mutation information for uh, treatment. Invite addresses these diverse needs through their targeted profit, uh, product offerings, which we just went over, and strategic uh, acquisitions, highlighting the complexity and um, varied nature of the genetic testing market. Then we have Invite processing the sample in the next step. Invite employs both centralized and distributed models for processing genetic tests with um, centralized CLIA labs, as they call it, for germline screening and distributed kits for somatic screening. The acquisition of ArcherDX was supposed to enhance their portfolio, adding uh, many products to de in development, uh, which would capture significant market opportunities in oncology. Lastly, Invite annotates the data. The company apparently goes beyond simply identifying genetic variations. They invest in dif differentiating between germline and somatic mutations and in technologies for understanding structural variations in gene expression. Again, which we will get into later, their strategic acquisitions like Jungla and investments in user interface and customer support is supposed to accelerate um, at delivering actionable insights to patients and clinicians which gets back to what I was saying, serving as a database for genetic information. Now, this is a visual of that genetic-based database. This is Invite's entire goal for the healthcare system. 
to gather as much genetic data as possible and incorporate that into this new system to make more informed clinical decisions um, across the entire health healthcare landscape. Through this, you obviously have regulation around central principles like security trust, uh, permission to access personal data, which is highly regulated, um, which the company re- reiterates too. But this is what it is doing. It's basically data sharing. This is another illustration about how Invitae plans on scaling their brand across the globe. We will get into this much more later, but they believe by cutting costs significantly, enhancing uh, customer experience and accessibility, on top of poorly acquiring companies rapidly, believe they could scale to profitable growth. But obviously, this was not the case. Now that we know about the basics of this company, we can get into management where we will primarily discuss dilution, their failed growth by acquisition strategy, and management turnover. To start this off, I want to address their growth by acquisition strategy that failed. I created this illustration that has a timeline of each acquisition that took place, starting at the end of 2016 on the left, up until 2021 on the on the right. But I don't think many bulls understand the consequences of a company that rapidly acquired all of these businesses in such a short time period. Not to mention the many companies that do attempt growth by acquisition rarely go on to see it pay off. And if, and if it does, it takes a very long time for growth uh, a growth business that's just entering the market. It can be lucrative at times, but it comes down to timing and liquidity of the company purchasing. And in this case, it was poorly timed and they were strained financially, coupled with the transition and scaling issues, which I'll get to at the end of this slide. of the acquisitions here were intertwined with mostly stock deals along with cash, but most primarily being stock deals. For those who don't know what a stock deal acquisition is, it's basically giving away their stock in a form of cash to purchase a company. However, when when it does occur, shareholders get diluted depending on the weight of the acquisition. So right at the tail end of 2016 here, in the beginning of 2017, Invitae decided to acquire Cancer Gene Connect for $6 million. Moving forward in 2017, Invitae decided to also acquire Good Start Genetics for $24.3 million and Combi Matrix for $33 million. As the company moved into 2018, they made another acquisition, and this time it was Singular Bio for $55 million. Shortly after this, Invitae acquired another company called Jungla for $50 million. Then going forward in 2019 here, the company starts to have a field day acquiring Clear Genetics for $50 million, Diploid for $95 million, then Genlex for $20.7 million, and Uscript for $79.3 million. And these last two here were actually acquired together, but these prices are what Invitae ultimately paid for them. And as the company hit 2020, they decided to make one of the biggest acquisitions in stock deals in the genetic space ever. And this was Archer DX for $1.4 billion. Then to wrap up their wild acquisition spree, Invitae acquired Citizen for $325 million in 2021. Look, it doesn't seem like a lot of money at first, but this adds up to just over $2 billion in acquisitions, 11 of them total, in a span of only four years. Now, before I say any more about this this strategy by former CEO Sean George, investors need to understand how difficult it is to transition just one company into the parent company after it is acquired. This was part of the problem as why Invitae ultimately failed. They were assuming that these acquisitions were all going to be implemented at low expense and have their products scaled faster, but this wasn't a realistic view on the infancy of the genetic space. So just think about one company being acquired and how difficult that process is, but acquiring 11 in a time span of only four years is mind boggling. And later in the financial statements, I'll show you how this acquisition spree completely just overwhelmed and possibly killed the company, which it reflects in its current stock price today. So now what we are looking at here is the stock price history of Invitae from IPO in 2015 up until our current date. And you will notice on the right-hand side, uh, side where we have our current prices, uh, prices around $0.40 cents a share. 
this is currently incorrect, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, due to bankruptcy rumors that came out, but it's actually trading around $0.08 cents a share. So I just wanted to point this out so there's no confusion in this visual. But as you can see, shortly after IPO, the company went on its 11 acquisition spree for four years, which the market seemed to like, reaching almost $60 a share at one point. Then as the company wrapped up its acquisitions and they had time to digest them for transitioning and cost control, when they began reporting their financial results, the company started to show signs of distress financially and unclear and inconsistent guidance ahead. This led to a pretty decent decline here, um, as you can see. Then unfortunately, as investors had more color on where this company is and, and was going financially, it showed net losses that were on the rise and revenue uh, plateauing. It says here on the right hand uh, side, profitability, that's an error. It should be revenue since the company doesn't generate a profit and uh, not even close to generating it. But clearly without even going any further, this acquisition spree, which ultimately diluted shareholders into Bolivian and put the company in a severely bad liquidity position reflects in the stock price today. The byproduct of this failed strategy and now the, the hole the company has dug themselves, the board decided to part ways with former CEO Sean George and appoint the former chief operations officer Ken Knight to CEO. Management basically came out and said, we are done with Sean and moving on with Ken to see if we can get this company back to being healthy. So this wasn't like a surprise in any way. Then as time went on, we had an abrupt resignation from the chief accounting officer, Robert Werner. This was done without a solid explanation, but it really comes together and makes sense because Robert was seeing where the future of the company was headed and wanted to get out of there before it was too late. Along with Robert resigning, the chief financial officer decided to resign as well. The explanation from the, the company was that they wanted to pursue other opportunities. So with all of these resignations, except Sean George's, you have to ask yourself, why are these happening? If you're a reasonable and just look where the state of the company was at and going, it makes sense. Of course, you have dilution as well in the poorly timed acquisitions to add to the mess. But all of the management turnover was due to these terrible management decisions in a questionable future. And as always, we will take a look at insider buying and selling directly on the market. But we are not going to focus too much on this since there is really no weight attached to any stake by executives and the board. And with dilution, their stakes have been completely destroyed. So here we have Invitae's stock price from IPO in 2015 until current today with the red S's labeled as sells and green B's labeled as buys for that given period. As seen in the beginning stages of their acquisition spree, we have a couple buys and oddly a couple sells right after IPO. The buys were mostly done by Sean George and a couple board members. As they announced their, their newly acquired businesses, Mr. Market really loved it. Even before seeing how these companies reflected in their financial statements, and all we have are sales from the board and executives and some institutions. As time went on, resignations happening, um, financial statements starting to reflect distress like we went over in the stock price chart previously. The market started to take notice and we have our eventual horrible decline of where we stand today. The most concerning part of this illustration though is that nobody has bought a single share directly on the open market when the stock price went under $2 a share to all-time lows. You know, if you believe in this company's future and turnaround story or potential, you should be buying the heck out of your company's stock, especially when executives and board members don't have much skin in the game at all. So this ultimately paints a bad picture for long-term bulls on this company and this often goes overlooked and slightly over a year now there has been no transactions so i found that pretty interesting too we are now going to get into one of the worst things about this business and that's dilution when we went in depth about the timelines of acquisitions and how 90 percent of them were intertwined with those stock deals 
we now see why this had major long-term consequences because shareholders got diluted. When the company first IPO'd in 2015, after their offering, they started with almost 30 million shares. Today, the company has just over 286 million shares. Think about this for a second. It may not seem like a massive float, but where they started and ended up was almost a 900% increase. When we look at this on a dilution scale, this is much worse than Palantir's dilution debacle. I will show you a visual on our next slide on what I really mean about this. So what I did here is went back to their S1 prospectus, which is their SEC filing form for IPO. And the company, after their offering, IPO'd with almost 30 million shares highlighted right here. Then when we go down to the bottom here, this is their most recent 10Q, which is their Q3 2023 earnings. This displays the outstanding shares from 2022 and 2023, also depicting the 2023 beginning period and end period, which refers to the quarter over quarter increase. As seen, there was almost an 18% increase in dilution year over year. That's absurdly high and much higher than the general rule of thumb. Like I mentioned in our previous slide, this is an 860% increase in the outstanding flow. Not only does it surpass Palantir on the dilution scale in terms of percent, but it happens to be one of the worst culprits in the public markets right now. Most of the dilution has occurred from the acquisitions, but with their new debt offering that was approved by shareholders, it has contributed heavily to this as well. Lastly, we get into the core business where we will get into specifics on the financial statements, liquidity issues, and increased competition. The first thing I wanted to vaguely look at is the consolidated statements of operations from their Q3 2023 earnings. After this, we will analyze the cash flow for operations specifically. But when we take our attention to revenue up here, it actually declined over 9% year over year. This was largely due to restructuring of the company and selling off assets of their business, which they would have received more revenue for in the first place. As we make our way down to the total operating expenses in the middle here, we have an astronomical $1 billion in operating expenses. About 80 to 85% of this was from restructuring costs, which you can see directly above operating expenses here. This represented a 160% increase in operating expenses. Before we go any further, though, it should be noted that management did say these restructuring costs won't reach this high again, but it will continue on a downward trend. Now, we don't know how much these numbers will be going forward, but it won't be as much as we see it today, if that makes sense. It will be a recurring expense for the next couple quarters or however long it takes to get the company back on its feet. So with these expenses increasing and revenue falling, we have a 212% increase in net loss, representing almost a billion dollars in net losses. So overall, when we look at this, it clearly shows a company that is in significant financial distress right now. Then this here is the cash flow from operations from Q3 2023, where we will take a closer look at their cash burn and cash position as of current. There are only a couple metrics I want to focus on here since this company doesn't generate a profit. It's essential to analyze any metric related to their liquidity position, especially when they are operating deep in the red. At the top here, we have net cash used in operating activities, which was actually a large decrease year over year, meaning it's good they aren't using as much cash as they did previously, but it's still very bad. I mean, you don't, you don't want to see that. Going further down, we have net cash provided by used in investing activities. This is actually a bad thing, which is marked in red because they had to divest assets to get cash to fund operations. So that was a 165% increase. Then we get into an absurd metric that increased nearly 12,000%. And that was net cash used in provided by financing activities. This is different from investing activities. This refers to the debt offering shareholders approved for. So this is how they finance their cash through debt offerings, uh, further diluting shareholders. This is something they had to do, though, or they wouldn't have uh, been able to fund operations. 
as we shift further down to their cash positions at the beginning and end period, we had a 71% decrease year over year for uh, the beginning period, representing 266, uh, sorry, $267 million, which is much lower from the corresponding year. And then at the end of the period, the company had a 37% decrease in its cash uh, position, representing $168 million left over. Now, here's the scary thing bulls don't really want to look at. But what if the company didn't divest assets? The answer to this question is scary. And the other half of their cash actually came from debt offerings, which dilute shareholders. So like how much longer can this company continue to operate until they hit what seems to be inevitable uh, bankruptcy? And that's, this is something to think about. So this essentially brings us to the bankruptcy question, which is our entire bear thesis on this company. I want to show this now too, because as we are actually putting this presentation together, rumors about bankruptcy came out about Invitae. Although we don't know if they are true or not. It's likely true since the stock price dropped to $0.08 cents a share. It, I mean, a drop like that wouldn't necessarily occur unless it was true, but it would make sense. The company right now is just basically living quarter to quarter, and like we showed you in the financial statements, the company doesn't have much longer unless some miracle happens. So what has the company been doing to stop the expenses and cut costs? Management has actually done an excellent job, uh, given the, the current circumstances. As soon as Ken Knight was announced as the new CEO, he made the decision to cut 1,000 jobs uh, immediately and descale their, their products in areas that had questionable returns. When this happened, the company also formed a special committee that was solely focused on uh, cost-cutting. And shortly after that, Invite had to do what they had to do and sell one of their assets to a direct competitor uh, called Natara for $52 million. Then Invite decided to divest their second largest acquisition and asset, Citizen. This was unfortunate news, uh, but they had to do it. The Citizen actually went back to operating independently, which is a slap in the face to the Invite brand. Then most recently, the company cut an additional uh, an additional. 15% of the total workforce, further eliminating unnecessary costs. But even with all of these strategic moves, the company is still significantly operating in the red. And this should concern shareholders. On top of all of what's going on, the company is also in non-compliance with the New York Stock Exchange to remain listed on the exchange. As I'm sure you are all aware, there are certain criteria each public company has to meet in order to be listed and remain listed on the NYSE. The primary non-compliance other than the market cap issues now is that the share price of Invite being significantly below $1 per share for an extended time period. To explain this as short as possible, once your share price falls below $1 per share for a sustained 30-day window, you become in non-compliance. However, if you give a written six-month plan on how to increase the value of your stock, which is labeled in this letter to the NYSE, you are given that six-month grace period to increase uh, the stock price above $1 per share, or you will get booted from the exchange. That's how it works. Invite's plan was not to do a reverse stock split, which I'm, I don't understand why they wouldn't want to vote on that but to do a debt to equity offering which would fund them with cash whenever they exercised it and they could fund operations long enough until they turn things around and increase the company's stock value this was uh, voted on and approved by shareholders but it concluded that this plan has not worked considering the current time period and the stock's value at this very moment in the midst of all of this Invite also faces intense competition from much bigger and better uh, companies in the same relative industry it operates in. Here on the upper right-hand uh, side, we have Invite's current value as a company. On the left, we have the competitors uh, with their market value in comparison to Invite. 
And the obvious observation here is that these companies are significantly larger because they are with some already that are generating a profit. These are much bigger companies that are in much better liquidity positions, all while Invitae is losing its market share and headed down that, I mean, that, that potential bankruptcy road. It is also really unfortunate the company had to sell one of its assets to a direct competitor, uh, Natara, in the genetic testing space seen on this chart. Really difficult to sit through that transaction, I, I can imagine. And this brings us to our ultimate bear thesis on this company which was before those rumors came out, and that's that the company is likely headed into bankruptcy. When we looked over their financial statements and saw absurd dilution that has occurred and major liquidity issues the company had, it's really hard to believe that the company can turn this ship around without using that bankruptcy card. And when you combine that with the management turnover, the New York Stock Exchange noncompliance, and increased competition, it really paints a grim picture for Invitae. If the company took its time instead of aggressively trying their growth by acquisition strategy, I believe the company would be in a much different situation today. I really, I truly believe that. But here is somewhat, I mean, hope, hopeful good news for bulls. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I, I wouldn't ever call it good news if bankruptcy is ever on the table. But the company is likely to file for uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy and not Chapter 7. Chapter 11 is a reorganization of the company while they still operate. So it gives them a chance without all the strict requirements from regulators breathing down their neck. It's mostly like, it's most likely not Chapter 7. Since this means you are essentially uh, closing your doors permanently. So this is somewhat hopeful news because I, I, I really do believe that it's, likely to be chapter 11 but um i i doubt the company comes back from the damage that has already been done here but this is all we have for this presentation if you enjoyed the content like the video and make sure you give us a subscribe so you don't miss any of our future videos thanks for watching